When we think about prisoners of war, we tend to think about soldiers incarcerated who are captured. Up till 1917, there are more civilians incarcerated in Britain than there are soldiers. Welcome to 100 Years, 100 Objects, stories from the collections of Lancaster City Museums. My name is Millie Wellborn, Museum Assistant at Lancaster City Museums. 2023 marks 100 years of our museums and collections, and we're celebrating by examining 100 intriguing objects that help tell the story of Lancaster, Morecambe and the surrounding area. In today's episode, we're looking at a highly decorative object, made in difficult conditions, in a place that many people do not know existed. Today's object is a carved bone from the Caton Road internment camp. The bone is about 22 centimetres tall and about 7 centimetres across at its widest point. It is probably a cow bone taken from the food rations in the camp, but it has been elaborately carved. The main image on the bone is a rose, which stretches most of the length on one side. Above that is a fish surrounded by a ring of foliage, delicately carved with fins and scales. At the bottom of the front is a monogram of the letters W and S intertwined and enclosed in a diamond shape. On the back is carved Lancaster Camp, flanked by the dates 1914 and 1915. This bone is not unique, in fact it is actually one of a pair, and there are several other similar bones in the collection. This one and the others were made at the Caton Road internment camp, which was situated in the old Lancaster Wagon Works building during World War I. These buildings still stand and will be familiar to anyone from Lancaster as the long stone wall with high windows, which stretches for more than 250 metres along Caton Road at the edge of the city centre. We spoke to Corinna Penniston Bird, Professor of Gender and Cultural History at Lancaster University, to find out more about the bone, the camp where it was made, and the men who might have made it. So this bone comes from the prisoner of war, or strictly speaking, the alien internment camp that was opened in 1914 in Lancaster. When we think about prisoners of war, we tend to think about soldiers incarcerated who are captured. Now, that's more typical after 1917 in Britain. Up till 1917, there are more civilians incarcerated in Britain than there are soldiers of the opposing troops. When the war broke out, the British state very quickly had to decide what it was going to do with enemies of the state so Germans, Austro-Hungarians and then members of the Ottoman Empire who were in Britain and there were 57,000 Germans in Britain at this time. The decision is reached first of all with the Aliens Registration Act that they need to register at the local police station. They need to know where they are and what they're doing. Are they living here? Are they naturalised? There's different categories of German here. So they might be living here and in Lancaster we have two pork butchers of German descent for example. So they have families here, their children are at school here. Then we have the people who are passing through who just happen really unluckily on their holiday to suddenly get caught at a country that is now at war. We have sailors who leave Germany at peace and arrive in Glasson at war. Then they decide that they need to intern the men who would be of military age, that if they repatriated them, they would join up and fight the British. What happens over the next four years is that we have a flux of incarceration and then sometimes release and incarceration that tends to relate to what's happening in the war. So October 1914, Belgium falls. We have a huge number of Belgian refugees and anti-German feeling surges. And then again in May 1915, when the Lusitania is sunk, there's a huge anti-German outcry at these innocent civilians being killed and anti-German feeling goes to a peak and more civilians are interned then and are kept interned until the end of the war. So the camp at Caton Road is convenient because it's an empty building originally. The wagon works close in 1908. In 1914, some of the men of the King's Own Royal Regiment are housed there before they're sent for training but it's an empty, large building. And so it becomes this internment camp very quickly in August, September 1914. And on the bone, we have the date 1914, so we know it's right from the outset. So do we know who might have carved this bone in the camp and why they would have made an object like this? We have two possibilities for who carved this bone. If we think about who's in this camp, 
It could be an alien internee. There's a fish on the bone, so it could be a former seaman. We know that those are people who, who are held at Lancaster. But there are also guards at the camp, and the guards are just as bored and having to deal with the same tedium, the same military rituals. So we know that work like this served pastime and to calm nerves. So I really don't know whether it's by a prisoner or by a guard. And we've got evidence of both of those creating arts and crafts like this. The bone is to do with what is readily available in a camp. Well, we know from a diary from an inmate, Willy Wolf, that they had a quarter of an ounce of meat and bone in their rations. We know that these had various functions. We know that in some camps, and, it, and we're talking about a vast history of prisoners of war in all wars making art, and sometimes, yes, it was used for bartering. Sometimes they are used to cement relationships between inhabitants and prisoners. This one, though, is hollow, and there are stands, so it quite possibly is a vase. So it might have had a function, and a lot of the ones that were used as vases have flowers on them, so this has a flower. Of course, the rose has the additional Lancashire rose connotation. And then we know that they're kept within families, and originally they're mementos of a part of somebody's life if they survive the war, or a memento of someone who's died, and their meaning changes across the generations. But it's one of the ways in which... Some of the stories of the war arrive with later generations. And what's wonderful about the museum holding this is that it tells a story of the war that isn't part of the most popular narrative and the emphasis on soldiers on the Western Front. And it tells a story of some of the first anti-foreign legislation of the modern times that is introduced. And it makes us remember that war is always really morally complex. And that's why it's so important that the museum holds artefacts like this. We asked Corinna what we know about the camp and what life might have been like for those interred there. Well, luckily, we have two descriptions of life in the camp, one from an inmate and one from a guard. So the inmate one, which isn't very well known, is by Willy Wolf, who was a German Jew, who talks about life in the camp, how horrendous the conditions are. Only two bathtubs for 2,000 men, he says. When they're punished, they're punished by having their post withheld. So you can imagine how important it would have been to know about family members and also how the war was going when they're cut off from so many sources of information. So we know that hygiene, food is really important and the rations are not particularly generous. He lists them, there's half an ounce of meat, including bones, but there's a half an ounce of potatoes and one and a half ounces of bread, half ounces of tea. And there's quite a competition in the British press as to whether inmates of British camps are better treated and better fed than those in Germany and vice versa. So we know there's a lot of interest in what conditions are like in the camp. And interestingly, Wolf actually mentions in January 1915, well, I'll read you the whole entry because it, it gives a nice picture of the camp. Six men prohibited from writing for 14 days because they wrote to Germany about their incarceration with handcuffs and the like. That's possibly how they were arrested rather than how they were kept in the camp, but we don't know. The art of bone cutting has begun. Ashtrays, lamps, etc. are produced. So we get a sense both of the difficulty of the conditions, but also all the different things that men are doing. So we know that they are engaging in education and there are underage boys who are being kept at the camp, who they're trying to make sure they continue to be schooled before they can be repatriated. And we know they do sports. So we know, for example, that Pilates was inspired with his gymnastics regime by watching feral cats when he was incarcerated. And he was at Lancaster and then at Nokelo. Music. The local population is somewhat disconcerted by the band. They think that's a little bit too cheery when they can hear that playing and when the Kaiser's birthday is celebrated and things like that. But there's a whole range of activities. So we have, on the one hand, these dire conditions for sleep and for food and for hygiene. And then, on the other hand, we have wonderful camaraderie and all these other activities that are help keeping men sane. So the other way that we know about life in the camp is from a guard. And that guard is quite well known because it was Robert Graves who wrote an autobiography called Goodbye to All That. And he was in the Welsh Fusiliers who were among the first to go and guard the camp. And he describes how I went off on detachment duty to a newly formed internment camp for enemy aliens at Lancaster. The camp was a disused wagon works near the river, a dirty, draughty place, littered with old scrap metal and guarded by high barbed wire fences. 
About 3,000 prisoners had already arrived there and more and more crowded in every day. Seamen arrested on German vessels in Liverpool Harbour, waiters from large hotels in the north, an odd German band or two, harmless German commercial travellers and shopkeepers. The prisoners resented being interned, particularly family men who had lived at peace in England for many years. But he concludes they were actually safer in than out. So we've talked about the prisoners' experiences. The guards, of course, had a similar experience in terms of it being dirty and drafty, the barbed wire. But they can leave, and indeed some of them leave when they're not meant to, and go gallivanting about the town. And uh, Captain Faircloth of the Welsh Fusiliers is reported as saying that he had great difficulty keeping the men at the wagon works, and by men he means the guards, who are giving more trouble than the prisoners. So it's not a popular job at this part of the war. So what about life outside the walls? How did Lancaster react to the war and the camp which sprung up in its midst? It's really interesting how Lancaster approaches the war because it helps challenge some of the myths we have about how populations receive the news of the war breaking out. So Lancaster is a military town. The King's own Royal Lancaster Regiment has been here since the previous century. And they saw them go off to the Boer War and they saw fewer of them come back from the Boer War. And a lot of the townsfolk, when the First World War breaks out, remember that war. Were the boys, the boys who go and serve are the boys who saw those soldiers coming back and the Priory Regimental Memorial Chapel being built. So there's an awareness of war in Lancaster. And so when the war breaks out, the tone in the town is very subdued. There's not huge celebrations in the streets. There's an awareness of this is going to affect our lads and we can't predict how long this will last. So there's no this will be over by Christmas. None of that rhetoric at all in the press. It was possible to go on with your daily business without being particularly affected by the war until about 1915. And it is in 1915 that the first really large losses hit the newspapers at the Second Battle of Ypres. The first time poison gas is used and when the territorials are caught up. And in theory they didn't need to serve abroad but they were sent to a quiet part of the front that they agreed to go to and that quiet part of the front becomes a major battle. And after that, the seriousness of the war and the fact that everyday life is never going to return to normal, I think, becomes part of the fabric of life. I mean, you could still go to the cinema and watch Mary Pickford in the latest film, and you're still worried about food prices and things like that. But there's a huge upsurge in charity work. We have Belgian refugees in Morecambe and Lancaster. And of course, a lot of the local manufacturers, so for example, Linoleum is big in Lancaster, and that is a brilliant floor covering for mobile hospitals. So even local manufacturers uh, involved in the war, adapting their products to be suitable for the war effort. And then two munition factories are built, one in Lancaster next door to the camp in Caton Road, which may be one of the reasons why it closes, because you couldn't possibly have enemy aliens next door to a, a projectile factory and another one on the White Lund. The camp at Caton Road, when it closes, we're not quite sure when, but we know when we no longer have any letters coming with the stamp of the camp. There is material from the site auctioned off in September 1916, so we know it's definitely closed by then. And at that point, the Caton Engineering Company takes over, which is actually a cover name for torpedo manufacturing. I would love if those walls could speak the stories that that building could tell us. To finish, we spoke about what happened after the camp closed. Where were the inmates sent? And how did the area memorialise and remember what it had been through in the years after the war ended? We have quite a lot of records from Nokela that shows that a lot of men were sent to the Isle of Man, and geographically that would make sense. Although the camp houses people from as far afield as Manchester, Newcastle, Carlisle... There are over 300 internment camps by the end of the war, so there are plenty of places they could have been sent to. We do know that Lancaster Castle was used to house prisoners, but I think it's more likely those are military prisoners and that civilians did end up on the Isle of Man. We've already seen how many of the ways in which the war is memorialised are behind closed doors. They're in people's homes, they're the dead man's penny, they're these bones, the shells that people sent home from the front. So behind closed doors, we know that there are private shrines and, and stories around the kitchen table or silences around the kitchen table, which are just as poignant. In terms of the town... 
Before the armistice, there is already a discussion as to what is the appropriate way to commemorate the war. And there are two competing visions. One of them is for a more, what we would think of as a conventional war memorial. And the other one is for a utilitarian war memorial, something that would be useful to the town, to the survivors of the war. And we end up with the best of both worlds. We end up with both. So we have the memorial in town next to the town hall that is an angel and these incredibly moving panels of over a thousand names with brothers bracketed. And we have to remember that why it's so important to name the dead. It's because the bodies aren't repatriated. So this takes the place of a grave if you couldn't travel in order to see the graves. So we have that war memorial next to the town hall that is there to remind the civil dignitaries who work in the town hall what values it is their duty to uphold. And that's said at the speech when it's unveiled. But we also have Westfield War Memorial Village that is built to house disabled veterans. And that continues to be a housing association that prioritises disabled members of the uniformed services. It's one of the only such housing projects that has actually survived with its original intent. And then Lancaster in the centenary erected new memorials, new plaques that continued to help us to know the story of the First World War in greater depth and, and with greater variety. So the explosion at one of the munition factories I mentioned that now is commemorated with a, a, a plinth on the White Lund. There's a new memorial to philanthropists at Westfield War Memorial Village. Wally's Field was explicated. But the sorts of stories we continue to choose to emphasise, although it changed at the centenary, so we're better at remembering the contribution of women, the contribution of civilians, this story that's captured by the bone, that's still a story that we need to do a little bit more to make sure that part of the, the history of the war is known. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of 100 Years, 100 Objects. Please do listen to some of our other episodes, where we discuss everything from hat making to hagstones.